Because for a long time, the first lengthy profile was locked down. <laughs> if I can put it that way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody had to be locked down. So it was, yeah, also locked down. But now the lockdown has been lifted. Yeah. Good evening. Welcome to Personality Profile here on Joy 99.7 FM. My name is Lexus Bill. I always look forward to Saturday evening conversations where we bring amazing people into the studio. And yeah, we're back. Yeah. This evening is a very special one as well. Because for the past couple of weeks, yes, we've all been trying to wrap our heads around this novel coronavirus. The whole world is watching and waiting for a vaccine, hoping that all this would, you know, just leave so we can have our lives back. Some call it the new normal. We might not have our lives back. We might have a different kind of life. Oh, now we are so sh- we are doing social distancing. We're wearing masks. We're using sanitizers like body cream. <laughs> you know? We're washing our hands every day. Like We're not like the neatest generation. <laughs> we're washing our hands hundreds of times a day. Is that the new normal? But I've always wondered personally, though, how is it like to be on the front line? On 1st of May, Team Joy celebrated our frontline workers. We give a massive round of applause to our health workers on the front lines, our security services, doing an amazing job. But really, 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 do we know exactly what they go through? Do we know how it is like to be on the front line? Yes, you're a medical doctor. Show up at work and have a good time seeing to a patient, making sure that they will get better somewhere along the line. You're told that this patient you're seeing is COVID-19 positive. And I'm sure you're going to play back in your mind every second you spent with them to know, Hey, did I just contract the coronavirus too? You wait in anguish for a test that will take days. This evening, I really want to find out what it is like to be on the front line. And who best to actually tell us than one man who's been celebrated not long ago here on, on Joy FM, actually. He's an amazing brother, a specialist surgeon and physician at the Kolubu Teaching Hospital. He won the prestigious 2019 MT Shakumbi Prize in Neurosurgery in Nigeria. Dr. Abdullah Hadi Mohammed. Doc, how are you doing? Tell him I'm, I'm, I'm fine and I'm very excited to be here. Oh, I'm excited yeah, to have I, you as well. The only thing is that just scared me that, yeah, this is going to be the normal <laughs> and uh, we all have to be wearing masks. Yeah. yeah. You know that yeah. Our life can't, it can't, can't be, be like, like that. that. No. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think science and medicine has progressed quite well yeah. compared to 1918, 1919 during mm-hmm. the Spanish flu. And I think that mankind would, would triumph over COVID and Listen, get our backs normal. If, uh, if you're wondering why he is insisting strongly that life cannot be like this, <laughs> you've got to decode it. This man is a lover of life. <laughs> yes, he's, he's more like the enjoyment minister. <laughs> Even though he's a very accomplished surgeon, Listen, he enjoys life, and you get to know him a little bit more as we, you know, go along with the conversation. But he loves to have his good time, exactly. and he can't afford to be living like this with masks and social no, distancing, can no, you? No, 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 no. I mean, that, that <laughs> is not like that's not what we yeah. were created for, you yeah. know. And um, I am very positive. I'm reading every day. I'm getting very positive vibes about what our colleagues are doing around the world. Yeah. Um, in in Utrecht, mm-hmm. in uh, in Germany, even in in UAE, right? You know where I have my my family lived. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of work going on. Stem cell vaccines are being developed, and it looks positive. And so I you're think optimistic that, that in very very optimistic, and I'm sure by the end of the year we're gonna have our life back and we're going to enjoy life properly. Oh, somebody say an amen. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Really good to have you, and let me congratulate you on the award at the uh, in in Abuja, the 2019 MT Shokumbi Prize. Thank right? you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and 
I was actually looking forward to also meeting you, and I must say that you have a fantastic voice for for radio. Oh, is really, it really, really fantastic <coughs> voice for radio? World Flattery <laughs> Day or something? Because I, w- <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, um, brother. Yeah, and then, and, and of course, I've also watched you from afar sometimes in obscure areas where we can mention hey. now, but yeah. Hey. Uh, <laughs> performing very well. Of course, it's a very good MC as well, so. Philip, no, I'm volume. just talking about the MC as well. <laughs> Please lower the volume. <laughs> obscure <laughs> places are from <laughs> there. No, yeah. but thank you so much, thank Doug. You. I mean, I, I, I listened uh, to you on the Super Morning Show, and I thought that you have an amazing story. Um yeah. One that inspired me personally. I was so imp- I was so happy when you said uh, Hall of Fame. This song is is, exactly. is one of your favorite songs exactly. because for me it epitomizes people like you, exactly. you know, yeah. who need to be celebrated in the Hall of Fame because you've been through it all. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and 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 for you, how would you describe the whole journey? Well, I think it's it's, it's been amazing and and interesting, and uh, I've always summarized it as as focus, mm. uh, being focused and chasing your dream. And uh, as you might have heard in, in some of my interviews, I, I think that for everything that I dreamt of achieving in life at, at a very young age, um, I've, I've managed to, to achieve it, even with, with the difficulties. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my being a neurosurgeon uh, at a very young age, growing up in the Zungos, Mm-hmm. Uh, the type of woman I wanted to marry, I was always focused on that, and <laughs> and I managed to achieve that. Uh, so for me, uh, I always tell people, you got to be focused <laughs> and, and and always. <laughs> you know, and 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 this part keeps recurring in your story. Yeah, uh, it, it's like it's, it was so important to you, the type of woman you wanted to marry. Yeah, uh, tell me, what type of woman did you want to marry? I wanted to marry a highly ambitious, beautiful lady, an elegant. Uh, lady, mm. uh, well cultured as well, mm-hmm. um, and very confident, and and I mean with ambitions over the top. But someone also coming from, uh, let me say, a very low background who has also been able to rise up to where um, I also wanted to yeah. be, um, and to say that. <laughs> Yeah, probably a beauty pageant. <laughs> okay, I was I was <laughs> waiting for that part. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you know, you know yeah. what? Some of my friends used to say, "Oh, as for Dodi, uh, Dodi is my nickname yeah. uh, right from university." Oh, this guy, even if you somebody we miss, call you gonna cry. He will go after it. <laughs> it used to be something that my friends joked about. Yeah, but <coughs> so you just wanted a beauty queen. Yeah, I wanted a beauty queen. At uh, what at what age did you you know conceptualize this kind of woman? Oh, that was very early before um, GSS. Yeah. Before GSS. Before GSS. So yeah. that is primary. Yeah. So uh, beauty pageantry in in Ghana, the programs were always <laughs> very dear to me. I always <laughs> watched it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I I I thought there was something special about them. Okay. And the fact that they could come out and, and stand for such competitions and compete among people. That's right. For me, it shows how the ambitious they are, um, how confident mm. they are, and, and, and go get it, you know. And people have said so many things, but honestly speaking, uh, in my journey to landing my wife, I've, I've not um, actually come across some of the misconceptions that people yeah. have about beauty pageant. I think they are one of the great women. So is your, is, did your wife ever take part in a beauty pageant? She, she was in Top Model Ghana. Top uh, Model top Ghana, model Ghana. I see. And then, yeah, the, um, at a point, she was face of the universe for, for Ghana. So we used I to see. have uh, a big um, the billboard of her in Usu. Yeah. Aye. Yeah, and so uh, you walk past it and look at this and lady and say, "You, <laughs> look, I if I catch you, <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a big, a big one um, at home uh, with someone um, managed to to get for us. Uh, you remember the Kenu magazine? Yes, yes. Yeah, so she was the first person who was featured wow. in the Kenu magazine, and, and luckily for for us, uh, we have one of one, those one, one at home, yeah, which the children are growing. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, <laughs> if your wife also wanted 
beauty pageant man. <laughs> <laughs> I should get some. <laughs> and Mr. Ghana or something. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, like, will you qualify? <laughs> Charlie, I feel like I will qualify. You but qualify. you see that Mr. Ghana, they do in Ghana. <laughs> it's about muscles. And honestly, <laughs> you have none of that. Maybe Lesus has got it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you have it, but I, I think, yeah. Right. And, yeah, yeah, but, but I... In, se- in secondary school, I used to be the the, the ladies' guy, um, nice. as I remember. But I didn't have the muscles of Mr. Ghana. I used <laughs> yeah. to organize entertainment in, in secondary school. Okay. And, uh, you know, ladies who always want a sports guy or a brainy guy mm. or an entertainer. I was doing all. Wow. I was organizing entertainment in my school. I was playing football. I was playing table tennis. And was representing the school in what do you know? So mm. I was everything that ladies at that stage of our lives would <laughs> would wish for. Well, there you go. And, and I joined it. Yeah. If, if you're <laughs> listening and you're imagining and things, he's off the market. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the accolades he's pouring on himself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but you see, uh, it makes me happy when you talk with so much excitement because. Uh, understandably, the the atmosphere is one of edge, nerves. You know, people are not exactly sure what's going on, and especially for you in the medical field, yeah. uh, you you work with a little bit of you know edge, if exactly. I can put it that way. Yeah, yeah, and with a lot of uh, emotions because with um, my area of specialty, neurosurgery, we have just few, about seventeen in the country. Some part of Ghana actually don't have. Uh, neurosurgeons and even in West Africa when I, I, I sit at a clinic I see patients sometimes coming from as far as um, Congo, mm-hmm. uh, Burundi, you know, and it, it tells you how difficult uh, some of these patients might be going to. Yeah. People with brain tumor, we can't operate on them uh, at the moment. Wow. Uh, some may end up going blind, mm. some may end up dying from the tumor and, and there are times here you feel like uh, weeping when, when you think about what is happening. It's, and it's all because as a country over the years we've not really uh, invested in training, in training professionals. So mm-hmm. some of the doctors who uh, would have to manage the COVID patient in the intensive care unit mm-hmm. are those neurosurgery also need to give anesthesia. You can't perform good neurosurgery without specialist, uh, physician, mm-hmm. uh, anesthetist. And that is what the country is lacking. So this afternoon, I was actually telling my head of department that if I had the power, and probably that is one of the things which may push me into politics one day, I'm going to drive the training of specialists in this country and make mm-hmm. Ghana healthcare system one of the best in the country. Wow. Uh, probably uh, using myself as an example and going to the communities getting well-motivated students, putting them in school mm-hmm. and spreading them across the world to train to become one of the best uh, surgeons mm. and medical specialists and coming back to help. We really, really need to train a lot of people. It, it is unforgivable that, for example, we have only 17 yeah. uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, it's un- unforgivable that uh, we have just few physician anesthetists and Kolebu alone has 80 percent so you could imagine what is happening to areas like Confanote teaching hospitals and other hospitals yeah. and, and if you find me in politics one day probably these are some of the things which will motivate me to go into I mean politics. you've got our vote already with what thank you said you. because thank you and, and for the politicians the who yeah. probably are, are listening I have a lot of friends on both sides and and I know some of them are listening yeah um, and I think that this, this, these are the areas we need to really spend on training, training. Mm-hmm. We need to train a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, I would want when on well to be managed by uh, an expert, a specialist. Mm. Uh, even GP now in most part of the world, it's a special, it's a specialist program. It's no more like after medical school, then you go, oh, carry yourself along. I'm a GP, no. And you know, there's one thing about education. The more you acquire education, the more you read and get knowledge, that is when you realize how ignorant you are. And that actually motivates you to want to fight for more and get more knowledge. Yeah. So we yeah. always say that you have to read yourself out of ignorance. Yeah. 
and reduce your ignorance level. You know, so as I keep training and I acquire more knowledge, I begin to feel that, no, I don't know much. Mm -hmm. And probably some of the patients I treated in Winneba Hospital, if I, have, I had the knowledge that I have today, I probably wouldn't have treated them that way. But at the time in Winneba, I was touted as one of the best uh, doctors who have visited Winneba. But with advanced training, mm -hmm. I feel I could have even done much, much better. And that is wow. where we should be heading to. Okay. I mean, you put it profoundly, mm -hmm. and we hope that the system gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a few months ago, the world was introduced to the novel coronavirus. When did you hear of it? Yeah, I, I heard it um, somewhere in December, uh, early December, uh, when it started in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, um, we began to see the numbers and the people who, who were dying. And luckily, WHO uh, rolled out some few courses online, which uh, I decided to participate in to okay. accommodate myself. Uh, about the knowledge of, of the virus. Um, and then, uh, of course, I was also in constant touch with my wife being a crew and what was also happening along the, the airline industry. Okay. Um, at, so at the time when you took the course, did you think it was um, pandemic material? No, I, I thought that because it was localized, you know, it was something that could be handled like, uh, for the Ebola in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone. I never thought that we could have it coming here. And um, I got a wrong impression that Wuhan was like um, a very localized area in, in China that it would be easier for, especially for a communist state like China, to be able to handle it very well. But of course, um, I, I knew that also uh, China being um, a country where we had a lot of business and trade and, and airlines going there every day. It was a matter of time that it could spread to Asia, and, and that was where my, my fear arose. So mm. I remember always telling my fear that, look, always make sure you wear the mask and all that. Yeah. But I think China, excuse me to say, didn't really help the world uh, you think so they much. Failed us. They failed us. What could they have done? I, I think they could have, if they had believed the doctors, which is still happening in many countries. They have believed the doctors and locked down Wuhan uh, very early and prevented flight from going there. You know, we, we, we couldn't have found ourselves in this way. Yeah. And we realized that every single country, apart from probably even South Korea, which has been touted, and Taiwan, mm. we all committed the same mistakes. We failed to lock down our countries where they need be. If we had probably locked down Ghana, we wouldn't have had our first case coming in. If China had locked down Wuhan very early, the cases wouldn't have, have gone out. That is where the problem is. Mm. And you know, as, as a Muslim, I always take solace in, in, in the fact that, and, and of course, um, <coughs> some lessons from, from what Prophet Muhammad said, uh, that if you have or you hear of a plague or an epidemic of a sort in a particular city, nobody from that city should be allowed to move out. You know, and as a Muslim and as a scientist, uh, growing up and reading the Quran and having been to the medical school, I've come to realize that most of the revelations and instructions in the Quran ended up being proven later on. So I always take scientific instructions from the Quran very seriously. Mm. And this, for example, is one, is one, one of, of it. And if we had taken this very seriously, we wouldn't have found ourselves in, in this quagma. And now they've deprived you and me of yeah. our children. Oh, <laughs> at some <more. laughs> Well, fast forward. Um, the virus made its way out of Wuhan. Yeah. Um, we saw it start very mildly in places mm. like Italy, yeah. in places like the UK, mm. uh, the United States. I, I literally remember um, when it started. You know, in in the USA, yeah. I, w I I was stuck to almost all the news channels in the world, exactly. like literally shifting from BBC to <laughs> CNN to join news and then back like that. Wow. And I could watch the um, the the numbers the from, figures, yeah. oh, 400, mm -hmm. 500, yeah. then 600, then 1,000, yeah. 2,000, <laughs> then 3,000, <laughs> then 5,000. I'm like, <laughs> and, and, 10, and this was happening yeah. in days, yeah. Yeah. you know? And when it started in Ghana as well, mm -hmm. oh, five, six, eight, you know, like that, yeah. then it kept going. And now 
3,091 infections. Yes, that's, that's, that's huge. I mean, within uh, a few months and from for a country which is very far from um, China. Yeah. I mean, that, that's remarkable. And, and all these has been made possible because of travels. I mm. mean, no way uh, could have the coronavirus reach uh, Ghana, you know, uh, if hadn't it been for, for air travel. And it's something that we have mm. to live with it for the rest of our, our, our lives. And that is what makes it scary. And when you are a scientist and you, you have knowledge of this virus and you read how it is wreaking havoc, uh, across the world, you you are participating in webinars across the world, and people are giving you different presentation uh, of this virus. I mean, mm -hmm. for some of the neurosurgical platforms, for example, we've had the virus presenting as a brain lesion. Oh. Okay, uh, there's there's been a report of uh, somebody dying from ruptured heart. You know, and so <laughs> one of the fears for for doctors is. You don't know how this virus is going to handle, your body is going to handle this virus. There are even people that, very young people, by, by way of the body's reaction to the virus alone, it killed them. Mm. It actually killed them. There are some people also that their immune system was so poor that the virus actually wreaked so much havoc and led to multiple organ failure. Some will have mild disease. And unfortunately, if you look at the data, which... Uh, Fortunately, it's not being made available or it's not being forcefully pushed in Ghana. Yeah. People are not telling us how people react differently to the virus because we've had young people, young nurses, including Ghanaians, <coughs> who have died in UK, have died in the US. May their souls rest in peace. Yeah. These were people who were less than 30 years. Mm -hmm. If you check their records across the world, mm -hmm. especially in Europe, uh, and and, and uh, America, a lot of blacks are dying, and mm. people are beginning to query why. Yeah. Meanwhile, in mainland uh, Africa, we are having very low figures. So when you are a doctor and you you are seized with all these facts, it it puts some. I mean, it scares you. It puts some fear yeah, in you. And 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 then you begin to look at oh, these eighteen people, oh, these comorbidities because. You read around, you hear people who didn't have comorbidities who are dying. You don't know what made them go through that. Mm. And that is what I think should be made known to my brothers and sisters in Ashama, in, in Nima, uh, in Mamu, beware this disease from the, the figures that we have. It's beginning to <coughs> root itself there. You know, they need to take this thing very serious. And, and for medics, you always, especially when you are a medic and you test positive, mm -hmm. you ask yourself the next day, what, what else is going to happen to yeah. me? Am yeah. I going to go along the line of the patient without comorbidities who died? Or uh, I'll be able to scale through this. It's, it's difficult, yeah. I'll, I'll, <coughs> we'll talk about how Ghana as a country mm -hmm. is you know, combating the pandemic, but I want to know about your encounter with it you you actually saw a patient yeah. who was covered positive yeah right yes yes now this patient did you know they were positive before uh, you started treating them or before or w were they you know brought to you as a covered patient no no this patient wasn't brought to me as a uh, covid patient and today is about 2 months when i saw the patient and <coughs> i actually saw her sorry I actually saw her at the... The, the clearing of throat. No, yeah. What's up? <laughs> it's, what's up? You know, I, I was it, fasting, so <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my throat is... Are you, are you sure that is why? Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. You know, you say you cough or something. But even my patients, <laughs> now it is coming there. Oh, no, I don't cough. I ah, don't, okay. I'm not coughing uh, yet. I'm just trying <laughs> to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've actually had <laughs> a long-running, like, sinus problems uh, okay. over the years. So, yeah. Uh, there's a part of my body called the uvula, which is a bit long. And, <laughs> and I've had this for, for a very long time. So of course, the scientists know about it. Yeah, okay. but So I saw this patient at a clinic. And mm -hmm. interestingly, this patient was accompanied by my sister with her kids. My, my half-sister is more than 60 years. 
and brought her to the clinic. And um, at that time, we were really not prepared. Uh, the cases had begun to like trickle in in Ghana, and our preparation was not very strong. But um, but because of what I knew about China and the fact that we we're beginning to get cases, I'd already bought some masks for myself, so I okay. was wearing masks. And then this patient, um, I saw her. She needed an emergency surgery at the time. Okay. So I asked her to like prepare, do some scans, and come. Um, she did the the scan, and we were waiting to see her on the next Thursday, which was my clinic day. Uh, but I was called on the Wednesday that the patient wasn't doing well, and uh, they had to rush her to the emergency. And she was breathless. She wasn't breathing very well. So. Um, <coughs> I had to rush to go and see her and other doctors, the emergency doctors had seen her. And, and at this point, there was no mention of mm, coronavirus? No, no, because the attention was on the fact that she had a, a, a neurosurgical uh, problem. Okay. And they were waiting for, for us to, to go and attend. And I had calls from my mm. sister and her family. So I had to rush there to go and see her. Even though, yes, her condition at the time was quite suggestive, but, I mean, looking at the condition that she also had, it was also possible that she could have those symptoms, which Mm. was quite related to to COVID. And and, and you mentioned that you were not necessarily prepared, so I assume that you didn't really have all the PPEs. No, 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 I didn't have all the PPEs. I didn't have all the PPEs, and and so was my, my colleagues. And within three days, she improved remarkably she improved and then they moved her from the emergency to another ward and um, then whilst on the ward on that particular ward because they thought she had a chest problem and had to like manage her and I felt well the chest problem was clearing and whilst there I had very close contact with her on several occasions because Mm. we needed to turn her and that is where it becomes dangerous Mm. And finally, we moved there to our ward to have the surgery done. And then I saw a newspaper headline that a nurse had tested positive in Kolebu. So I began to probe to find out um, where could this nurse be. Finally, I spoke to some few colleagues who told me that the nurse was coming from the particular department that my patient was transferred from. Oh, wow. So when I, and then I probed further, and then they told me, oh, the, the nurse was actually coming from the what that this patient came from and so i said no we have to test my patient as well and of course the doctors on that particular ward had already been tested mm-hmm. and they told me not to worry their result came negative but i was like no this patient was quite dependent and if this nurse was managing her she might have come into very close contact with with this patient so yeah. there's a likelihood that even if others have tested negative this patient could test uh, positive because the nurse would be very close to her. And it took days, you know, and that is where the emotion started because uh, to get a result. Mm. H- I had how many it, days? It took 10 days to, wow. get, to get her report. And I remember the, I spoke to a colleague who was following up on the results for me and told me to relax. And the way the result was even disclosed to me uh, it was scary because, of course, I had one of my sisters who was more than 60 years had been with her from day one. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my senior sister, the one that I follow, mm-hmm. had come to visit the same patient, not because she came there to visit her, but had gone to see somebody and heard she was there. So she also went to visit her. So I was torn between myself and my family and the yeah. external family. Yeah. Uh, even though this patient is not like a direct family member, but I've because she was a friend to one of my sister, so I just told him, "Look, I said, tell me the result, you know." And and this was the re- <coughs> you, you were asking of the result of the patient. Yeah, of the patient. Okay. Then I said, "Look, um, we've had some result, but her name is not in." And then five minutes later, then he sends me another message. I was the patient name. I mentioned the name. So, oh yeah, she's positive. Wow. Yeah, and. So the information was sent to the deputy medical director, who was uh, also my, my senior and one of my teachers, and uh, he then put it on our WhatsApp page that that's what has happened. So all of us have to be tested. 
And um, at, at at that point, what were you thinking? Yeah. For, did, did you for think that you you definitely yeah, would? Yeah, have I, it? I I knew I I definitely would have had it. And um, then I began to t- think of my kids, uh, how my wife was going to feel, my external family. I have half siblings who over five of them who are more than 65 years. I began to think about them. And uh, and you know that my background, where I'm coming from, so the impact, if, if something happened to any of them, w- what, what was going to happen to me. Um, but finally, we had the result, the sample taken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but something interesting happened. The moment they took my sample and the guys left, within five minutes, I was like, what? why did I even give my sample to them? <laughs> I could have just walked and be happy without uh, <laughs> knowing my status. You know? and, and for a doctor to think that way, it, it should tell you how far we need to like, educate uh, people. I actually regretted at that moment. That really? I actually allowed them to... to and, and this I'm saying mm-hmm. uh, qu- quite freely. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm sure there were other doctors like that, you know. Especially knowing the fact that some of my colleagues who were exposed, it took them some days to get the result. It was taking some people almost two weeks to get the result. And until I got my result, like this, Charlie, every 2, p- uh, 2 a.m. at dawn, for some reason I woke up and be- begin to think. I couldn't sleep. You couldn't sleep? No, I couldn't sleep. And I was always thinking of my my children, especially my son, who was so attached to me. <sighs> and there are times he would just walk and want to sleep, but even though I told them that no, nobody should uh, come close to me till I get my result. But there are times he just walk into my room and before I realized he's sleeping. So I was really worried uh, for him, you know, and the kids want to play outside. They mm. were playing with their other colleagues. So it, 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 was, it was quite difficult quite a difficult moment. So wh- whilst you had to wait for your results, you, you had to self-isolate? No, we were told that because our area of, of specialty, and that's where I talked about trading, mm. we were told that we cannot self-isolate as neurosurgeons. What? Because we offer specialist, uh, specialized service. So we need to continue working. We just have to make sure that uh, we wear masks and wash our hands, but we must still run the clinic. So unlike other departments which were closed uh, down because people tested positive, we did not have the luxury. The impact on, on health care of, of uh, many patients with spine tumors, brain tumors, mm. was going to be enormous. And, and so we had to continue working. Um, yeah, there were times I felt, well, could I have actually told the patient that, look, <laughs> I'm, I, I, sh- I should have been on s- uh, self-quarantine. But, yeah. uh, because... Ethically, yeah, it, it was a dilemma for, for some of us, but yeah. Thank, so thank so what, what, what did you have to do if you had to see a, uh, a patient knowing that you didn't know your COVID status? Yeah, I had to wear, make sure that I was wearing my, my masks. Um, I had my own sanitizers and was always w- washing mine. And make sure that the patient, so usually... In the consulting room, the patient sits very close to us, but for this particular case, um, we made sure that we had uh, only two consultants in a room. Uh, for colleagues, we don't have the luxury of one consultant to, to, to one room. So, yeah. and, but we spaced the patient, so the patient was, was standing uh, far away. Uh, sits a Sitting bit far, far away yeah, more than you. two meters actually okay. from us. Okay. And uh, we, we offered, off, if we had a lot of Say neurosurgeons, probably yes, we, we could have self quarantine, but it, it meant the whole unit. So, how long did you have to wait for your results? Yeah, I had to wait for five days. Five days? Yes, for five days, yeah. And, and those were five days of oh, sleepless nights? Oh, that was, night. I tell you, of sleepless night. I couldn't sleep. Every 2 a.m., and it was precisely every 2 a.m., exactly 2 a.m. every day, I woke up to think, to think that, that what, what next? Mm hmm. You know, and, and it was harrowing. And uh, the fact that I knew I had a patient on my ward uh, with whom I was managing, so it means that my shoes, everything was potentially contaminated every day when I go to work. 
And so I couldn't even meet my kids at the door, especially my son. There were times he would get very angry with me that I was trying to avoid him. You have to take out your, your sho- take off your shoes, uh, take uh, take off your clothes. So there are times we actually hide and go home a bit late mm. uh, when they are asleep. So I could uh, take off my, my attire and then put it into the, the laundry mm-hmm. and quickly uh, wash it and then wash down uh, as, as quickly as possible. So at <laughs> that 2 a.m., eh, mm-hmm. when <laughs> your body wakes up like that, what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's the result. And what if, if, if I'm positive? Uh, I was always thinking about that. I was always, because one thing is my wife is not here. And I, I knew very well that stigmatization was very, very strong. And, and you heard it also on Newsnight as mm-hmm. well. I was scared of my children. It's not their fault. And my worry is if, if they test positive, would they be able to play with other kids? Because they can't be indoors all the time. At least they should be able to come out and walk around. Mm-hmm. You know? and, but I was always scared of that. But my neighbors were were very positive. Uh, even though they knew we had they, we had a patient on our ward, they still allow their kids to once a while play with my my children. And I want to say hi to uh, the Aquas, who are my my next door neighbors. They really did uh, very well on that. And and I think they are a good example for other doctors and health workers. So is, is it that you help you you shared the information with them? Yeah, they they knew. Okay. Yeah, they knew. I'm asking because uh, of the issue of stigmatization. Yeah. And um, you, being in the thick of it mm. uh, and uh, hearing all the stories that we hear, I'm sure mm. you probably would think, okay, let me just keep it to myself and go about my duties without anybody knowing because you, you never know how people are going to see. For, for some people, yeah. uh, once you're covered positive, it's like a death sentence yeah. and nobody wants to get close to you. Exactly. I mean, when... My result was taking quite some time to come. I resigned myself to the fact that probably I'm positive, you know, because uh, my wife had told me that in Dubai, I mean, when you're positive within six hours, you could get your results. But when yours take a long time, it means that you're uh, probably negative, and that's why uh, your result took that long. So I felt probably I'm positive. And then I started, like, thinking uh, through it. Look. Well, I'm, I'm positive. I have to face it. So one of the things I actually planned doing was that when the result come, I was going to be an ambassador. Okay. I, w- I would declare to the world that, look, I'm positive and, and I'm going through, because stigmatization could actually set us back uh, if, if we don't take it serious. So yeah. it was something I wanted really to do if, if I was positive, just to try and kill the stigma. After all, I'm a neurosurgeon. Mm. If you stigmatize me, it means that you don't want me to see your <laughs> your, your family. You know, and, and that is what I also expect from uh, highly placed people in society. For example, God forbid, if the president is positive, I say, well, I'm positive, or the vice president, or a minister. These are people that a lot of Ghanaians patronize, no matter what. A businessman will not say, I won't go to the president, because you, you have to run your business. If the president is going to help you or the minister. Mm-hmm. And so when these people come out, people that are revered in society and they talk openly about COVID, it will make it very easy. Elsewhere, people are being celebrated when they come home. It is not the same thing. We are hiding uh, people and sending them home. And, and I think it's something that we need to really work hard at. Mm. Yeah. At what point did you tell your wife who you said wasn't here? Yes. Right? She was yes. out there. Yes. At what point did you tell her about your exposure to a COVID patient? Yeah, I, I told her the next day. The first day I couldn't uh, tell her yeah, because I, I knew her reaction. She she would also go down um, emotionally mm. because our bodies were closed. She can't, she can't come down already. That was an issue for mm-hmm. her. You know, the fact that she was there and couldn't come back home. So but yeah, finally when when I told her, yeah, she 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 took it in in good faith. She said, look, let's wait and see what what happens. Yeah, and we we knew any of us could guess it from mm-hmm. her job and, and from my job. We always knew that both of us were at risk, unfortunately. And um, so 
if I had even tested positive, I think the family would have taken it in, in good faith. Well, okay, so now in that state where you were not sure of your results mm. and <laughs> now you're, <laughs> you're, your mind is just, you know, wandering, mm -hmm. what kind of support did you need? What did you wish for? What, what, what would have helped your situation? Yeah, I think that probably if I had a psychologist talking to me, but again, training comes in. We don't have a lot of psychologists. I've seen Dr. Amma Edwin doing a yeoman's job and some of their colleagues, not Edwin, but even them, they are not many. But those, those were the moment that we needed clinical psychologists to talk to us. You know, sometimes people feel because we are doctors, we are, we are strong-headed. Mm -hmm. But no, you, everybody can suffer from uh, mental health. And, mm -hmm. and waking up at 2 a.m. was not normal. Mm -hmm. It was because of the emotional trauma that I was going through and, and um, dreading the fact that I could be positive. And that's where I needed a psychologist. Did, did, did you reach out for one? Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the organization didn't provide one for you. No, no. I mean, and, and it's still not, not happening. And, and this is what a lot of health workers have to really, really go through. Some health workers have tested positive. I think the emphasis, of course, have been on those who test positive. positive but yeah. waiting for the result itself is, is, is harrowing. And you need a psychologist to talk to you. And and I want to use this platform to actually appeal to the Ghana Psychology Society to look at health workers who probably have undergone this test and are waiting for their result. And we all know that people had to wait for 14 days. In some instances, people have even had their result getting missing and has to undergo another test again. Those people need psychologists. And look, it could be like this, it could be me. Publicly, we may appear very strong, but Charlie, yeah. if you've been bounced before and you cried, the lady <laughs> bounced in. <laughs> so that all of us can go through yeah. emotional uh, yeah. turmoil. Nobody, when it comes to emotion, it's, it's not much work. Yeah, and and anybody can can break down. Wow! If you're just joining in, I'm spending time with Dr. Abdullah Hadi Mohammed. Um, he's a neurosurgeon and. Uh, he he's had a stint <laughs> with COVID. Luckily, after five days, um, how was the news uh, shared with you? Oh wow! It was as if I was reborn. <laughs> 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 wow! I was so happy because I couldn't wait to hug my children. I just couldn't wait to do that. I was so 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 happy. Um, but they all. It was short-lived after <laughs> three yeah. days. Uh, then I remembered, no, my wife, eh, sorry, my senior sister had actually visited this patient. So I called her. And that was during the lockdown period. Yeah. So she said she can't come. Just look, just pick a taxi. And other members of, uh, members of the family of the woman, if they come, I'll pay. And during the lockdown, I'm sure a lot of people had to do that. People had to pay from their their their, their pocket to mm -hmm. be able to to come for some of these these tests. Yeah. And you see, when you go through the experiences that some of us go through, and we raise questions about, uh, for example, our testing, the contact tracing. For mm -hmm. my for my sister, for example, she could have been missed. Mm. She could have been missed totally. Yeah. But I brought her in. I got some people who visited the lady to to get them tested, because some of these patients may not even be. Uh, in 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 a state that they could actually give those information as to the number of people they've come into contact with, and I think going forward these are the things that we should look at. And when my sister's results uh, also came negative, that was when I was overly uh, happy. And then later mm. the patient also had some scans, and her scans were so good. Mm. And but there's something I must also mention. You know when the patient tested positive. Mm -hmm. There was a decision that we took as a unit, and I must thank uh, the deputy head, uh, medical director of the hospital, Dr. Akutu, who actually took the decision that, look, the best is for us to manage the case instead of sending the patient to the isolation 
uh, center. Oh, okay. So you manage the yeah, we manage the patient. So we it was like facing our fear, mm. you know. And by taking that singular decision, we have become very confident wow. in managing uh, these cases. And for now, I'll say that most of the fears that we had about COVID is gone. There were periods that I actually felt I could go see the patient just with masks, without a full PP. Of course, this patient had been with us for over a month. Yeah. I saw this patient uh, at a time that uh, we didn't know she had the disease. I, I went seeing her when she could have infected me with just marks. So it, it built our, our confidence. Okay. And I think those are the things that other doctors would have to look at. You must face your fears what and fight it. What is the status of this patient now? Oh, yeah. She, her last two uh, results came as negative even so though she has it, recovered it, yeah it took it took a very long time almost two weeks to get those results and yeah and i think that is also affecting our recovery data mm. so for mm. for people that we know are covid patient the moment the result is taken i think within a matter of 48 hours we should make sure that the result comes out and we'll be having like very high recoveries if yeah. we are able to to do that you know so director general of the ghana health service dr patrick abuaji has mm. revealed that 76% of COVID-19 related deaths are uh, in males. Mm -hmm. uh, deaths are in, in, in our males, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the country has recorded nearly 400 new cases, mm -hmm. bringing the case count to 3,091, 303 recoveries and 18 deaths. Mm -hmm. um, now, this represents a jump of 372 new infections from the last update. At a media briefing, at the Ministry of Information, he explained uh, about 90% of the cases are managed at home and isolation centers. We have about 2,765, a count of about 90% of those cases presented with asymptomatic, or oh, they had some mild symptoms, and most of them are being managed at our at home treatment centers and mainly at the isolation centers. 618 of this number had come from the routine surveillance and as, as much as 2,032 has come from the enhanced contact tracing. Of the 18, there's about 76% of them are males and 23% females. 11 out of these deaths were above 60 years and four cases were within ages of 40 and 59 and two cases aged between 25 and 39. We have also recorded deaths in the age of 15 to 25 bracket and, and uh, one less than um, 15 years. What do you make of these stats? Hmm. You know, and I want to start with, with the deaths. Um, I mean, for, for the male preponderance, it's, it's, it's known all over the world that a lot of males are dying from this. Uh, disease, but I, I form an impression that those advising the authorities in Ghana, including the president, sought to create an impression that people are by and, and you also heard it that oh they were above sixty years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for Ghana we have to be very careful and look uh, it, at it within a certain context, especially for those above sixty years in Ghana. Most of them are not dependent rather people depend on them and the economic and or the socioeconomic impact of these losses could be could be, could be great um and and as we've seen elsewhere there are younger people who are also dying so my advice is that the advisors of the president should stop telling him that People are dying because they have comorbidities. We have a lot of hypertensives in this country. They are not dying. They are not dying. If, if anything at all, probably they will die from stroke or, or heart attack. So if the person gets uh, COVID and die as a result of the complications of the COVID, I think it is unfair. It's unfair to the disease. It's unfair to the family to say that just because the patient is diabetic, you could, you, the patient could have actually gone maybe 20 years more. And some of these people may be employers. We've not looked at the impact. Probably we should take every single step and analyze it. You know? And my fear is that we are beginning to create the impression that this is a very mild disease. It is not. If you look at the figures across the world, it is not. And nobody should compare this to flu. It is not. They are not the same. This is not the same as malaria. 
this is not the same as HIV. HIV can be managed. Malaria, we have a cure for malaria. We don't have a cure. There is no um, vaccine for COVID-19. We do not. And that is the context I want to situate this. Until we get a cure for this, that comparison of meningitis, malaria, we should stop it. Because when this disease affects a lot of Ghanaians, and if you are to use the model around the world, that 5% of people will be critically ill. If you hit 10,000, okay, and you get about 500 Ghanaians, we don't have that capacity to manage those patients. And that is when our tests will be stretched. And that is when we start telling people who probably have mild symptoms and feel that they have the virus, we tell them to stay at home. Until they are, and that is what is happening in UK at the moment. And we've seen UK is not a good example. Mm. Boris Johnson is being toasted. It is not a good example. We must not follow it. Because once you overwhelm your healthcare system, which there's a possibility that we could reach there, when we get there, we may not be able to test people. And people will die at home unnecessarily. I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom. I'm just using the signs that I have learned. And I'm also using information that I'm getting from across the world, from yeah. programs that are going on, that you cannot determine how the disease or the cause of the disease in an individual, no matter the age of the patient. Okay. We, you can't tell. Dodi, final yes. question to you. Should we be locked down? I think we should do targeted lockdowns for now. I think that we should look at the data, and that is where we mean what we mean by science and data, the usage of science and data. We should be giving the data on areas like, say, NEMA or Mamubi. You know, you may even got cl uh, clusters around some area. Yeah. You lock down that area, and then you do testing. Okay. These figures are about greater Accra. We don't know where the figures are coming from. And I think the patient should, uh, the, the president should look at the data properly okay. and do a targeted lockdown. You've advised the president, the government, and medical society. Final word mm -hmm. to the general public in 10 seconds. Yeah, the final word is that look, I think that we should st stop stigmatizing people. Uh, anybody can get this. It's the, the patient who tested positive didn't get it because they wanted to get it. But we must be positive that science today is far better than 100 years ago. That's okay. 1919, 1920. It's far better. And we'll definitely get a cure. And we'll go dancing back again. We can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah Hadi Mohammed. God bless you, Ate. Thank and God you. protect you and the whole family Thank and you. your children as well. Thank and you. your wife in Dubai. <laughs> yeah, hello to all the, the, the Emirates Ghanaian crew in, in Dubai. I know you are listening. Yeah. I said uh, good evening. And 